When I came to the Lord, I got saved one week. Two weeks later, I was called to preach. Six months later, I was a pastor. You're talking about a whirlwind experience. I was looking for sermons anywhere I could get one. And I came to the convention. My pastor uh, was down here. I went with him to drink some coffee and pearl at the uh, Shoney's. And we're sitting there in, uh, in the Shoney's. And he says to me, he says, Gene, do you want a sermon? I said, man, yeah, I need a sermon. So I got the napkin. I got my pen. And I got, he said, this is a sermon on blind Bartimaeus. Great, blind Bartimaeus. He said, point number one is he could not see. Wrote that down. Then he says, point number two is he had no vision. Well, that sounded a whole lot like the first one, but I thought, well, you know, vision. So I wrote that down. Then he says, number three is he was blind as a bat. And I realized that they were having a fun at my expense because that wasn't a sermon I could use at all. But I want to talk to you this morning about God moving in the life of a blind man. John chapter 9, that's where we're going to be. And when you come to that location, Jesus tells us, or John Wright records this story about Jesus healing this blind man, but he actually heals this blind man twice. He heals him of his physical blindness, but he also heals him of his spiritual blindness. And, and, and it's in keeping with the calling that God gave uh, uh, to Jesus, because when, when, he, uh, when he began his ministry in Nazareth, and I read this last week in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed. And so recovery of sight to the blind was one of the things that Jesus was mandated to do as the Messiah. Not only that, but when you read the scriptures, what you'll find there are some summary statements that Jesus healed all these folks, and many times, and it'll say, and some blind people, or the blind people were included among that. And so he healed a lot of blind people, but there are several that are recorded in the scripture that are so interesting. One is blind Bartimaeus there in uh, Luke, uh, rather Mark chapter 10, verse 46 that I just referenced a moment ago. But in Matthew 9, he healed two blind men at the same time. They came to him crying out, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do? Do you believe that I'm able to do it? And they said, yes. And so Jesus spoke to them. Their eyes were opened. And then he tells them, don't tell anybody. And so these guys were healed. Not only that, but in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22, they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. In other words, this guy got all kinds of problems, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see, and all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? And that's what we're looking at here this morning. John records this information Basically, I think, to, in order to prepare the way and to convince people that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. He has come to be the light of the world. And in our scripture here in, uh, in John chapter 9, in verse 5, it says, While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And so Jesus brings light, and light dispels darkness, whether it's physical darkness blindness physically or spiritually. And so as we look at this story, what we find is that the true light, which is Jesus, has come into this world. Back in chapter 1 of John, John records that, that he is the light. John the Baptist was not the light. He came to give witness to the light, but he says Jesus is the light that was to come into the world. And so we're looking at an illustration of it here in this story, how Jesus brings light into the darkness physical darkness, but also spiritual darkness. Look at these first five verses as we look at the setting. And as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither this man, that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so we have this blind man who has been blind from birth. He's never seen the light of day. 
He, he never saw a sunlight rise like we saw this morning. He never saw the beauty of the spring flowers. He never saw any of the gorgeous things that you and I have the ability to see. He's been blind all his life. And Jesus comes, and he sees this man. And he doesn't just see the man. He moves toward the man. It's so interesting to see the difference between how Jesus sees the man and the way they see him. Jesus then begins to reach out to him. He begins to move forward to him. He, 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 has, done his, he has compassion upon this man, which leads me to wonder, how many times do we see people but never really see them? We may see them in their professional role. We may see them in some other way. But do we really see them as, as those who are hungry to be loved and to be touched? That's how Jesus saw this man. The disciples did not see him like that. What we find here is that they saw him, but they, they, they didn't see the man. They saw his blindness. And so they asked the question, who sinned, him or his parents, that he's born blind? And Jesus corrects their theology. Now, don't we, have time, we don't have time to go into all of the theology about sin and their background, but what Jesus says is nobody sinned. That's not the case. This man is blind, has been born blind, in order for us to be here today so that you can see the power of God displayed in him. And that's precisely what is going to happen. And so Jesus then moves in this man's life. And the, uh, this man's hurt gave him an opportunity to demonstrate that he was exactly what it says here in verse 5. He's the light of the world, and he is able to remove and to dispel the darkness. So what does he do? Well, he heals the man. Look at it in verse 6 and following. And what he says here is, When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which, may, which is translated sent. And as he went away and washed and came back, and so he went away and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. While still others saying, No, but he is like him. He said, he kept saying, I am the one. Therefore they were saying to him, How then were you, your eyes open? He answered, The man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. So as we look at this passage, what we find is that Jesus heals this man. And it's interesting to see how he does it, the method that he uses. He makes spit. He spits on the ground, makes spittle, and applies it. Now, would you like to have some mud made out of spit put in your eyes? I, I, I just kind of react to that uh, initially. But the fact of the matter is, this man's blind. He didn't know what it was anyway. He couldn't see that he spit on the ground unless he heard him. I mean, the fact is, though, he puts it on there. And why does he do that? He does it so he can say to the man, go to Siloam, word means sent, and wash. And when you do, you're going to be healed. The critical element here is what? Faith and obedience. The man did what Jesus told him to do. And when he did what Jesus told him to do, guess what happened? A miracle. That is what we would term it. But John calls it a sign. A sign of what? That Jesus is the light of the world. And so what we find is this man had to be obedient to the word of God, the word of Jesus, in order to receive the benefit. Are you listening? When we obey God's word, when we do what the word of God tells us to do, then we too can experience the benefits that God wants us to experience. But it's not going to happen until we are willing to do what he tells us to do. And this is an extraordinary miracle because this man, it's, we read it again up there in verse 1, he was born blind. And the blind man himself says in verse 32, Nobody has ever heard of the opening of the eyes of a man born blind. And this was a unique miracle. This man is unique. He's the only one in all the Bible that we're told was born blind. Jesus healed many blind people, but only one that was born blind. And what we find is it was a life-changing experience. Just think about it. This guy has been blind all his life. 
And suddenly he is able to see, he's able to function and do everything that he wants to do, that, that a person can do. And, and what it reminds me of is that just like Jesus opened his physical eyes and eventually will open his spiritual eyes, when you and I experience spiritual deliverance, and we get our eyes open spiritually, guess what happens? It opens up a whole new life. It opens up all kinds of opportunities for us to experience the fullness of God in our lives. And so what we find is that this man's, this miracle was met with skepticism. Some people said, well, he, he, he's God. Others said, no, he's not. But what does the guy say? In verse 9, he says, I am the man. I'm the one. I'm he. And so what we find is that they then ask him, how did this happen? How, how did this come about? And he tells them that it, he said, the man who is called Jesus healed me. Now he tells what they did. He made clay and anointed me, but it's Jesus. Here's a wonderful truth. Jesus can change your life. Just like Jesus came into this man's life and changed his life, Jesus wants to change your life, and he always wants to change it for the better. He wants to bless your life. But in order for that to happen, you have got to believe him, and you have to obey him. So now, I want to think with you a little bit about the rest of the story. I'm not going to read it because it goes from verse uh, 13 through 41. But I want to think about uh, two things. What is the significance of these verses that follow here? Well, there are two things that have become very evident when you look at those verses. Number one is that this man who has given sight, this blind man, moved from an initial touch where Jesus put the spittle on and washed his eyes, and he washed his eyes when you could see, to the point that he is willing to say that I believe, and the scripture says, and he worshiped Jesus. So how do you get from that to that place? Well, it's a progressive thing. And as you look through these verses, what you'll find is he was little by little growing in his understanding of who Jesus is, and it culminated with him confessing Jesus as Lord and also worshiping him. The first thing that is pointed out here uh, that we see is in verse 17. These religious leaders ask him, he, they bring him to him, uh, bring him to them, and then they, they're asking him about what happened, and they say to him, what do you say about this man? And he says in verse 17, he's a prophet. Obviously, he's a, he's a unique fellow. He's a prophet, but they do not believe that. They, they're unwilling to accept that. And, and so what they do is they invite the man's parents in and, because they want verification. And so they bring the parents in, and the parents are unwilling to get involved because they know that if they take the side of their son, they're going to get kicked out of the synagogue. And so they say, he's a grown man, ask him. And so they come back again to ask him what had happened. And in verse 25, look at what he says. He says, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. He says, I don't know about what you're talking about, but I know one thing, something has happened in my life that is extraordinary. Where I was blind, now I see. And that's his personal testimony. Which, by the way, do you realize that the most powerful thing that you have is your personal testimony? No one can take away what God has done in your life, and you know that. Yesterday, I was visiting with one of our members, and we were talking about a number of things, but in the course of it, we were talking about, and he was sharing with me his personal testimony. And I, I tried to help him say, the, the one thing that is the most powerful tool that you have to help other people and was wondering about helping other people is to share your personal testimony. Friends, I want to tell you, Jesus came into my life, and he changed my life. Now, if you know that he came into your life and changed your life, you don't have to. This man knew no theology. You ain't got to know a lot of theology. He didn't know any of the Bible. He had never been trained in it. But he knew one thing. Jesus had changed his life. Now, 
What I'm sharing with you is that is the witness that you need to be bearing to other people. You can tell them, let me tell you about Jesus and what he's done in my life. And then eventually, through the process that we're going to be looking at, they will grow also in their spiritual life, even as you and I grow in ours. What we find is this man shared his testimony. And then the Pharisees asked him again how it happened. And the man sarcastically says, well, do you want to become his disciple? And they said, we are Moses' disciples, but you are his disciple. Now, here's another little step forward. The man says he's a prophet. The man says my life has been changed. And now he is being identified with Jesus as one of his disciples. And that leads to the next exchange where the Pharisees say, we don't know where this man is from. And the man responds by saying, well, that's interesting because we know that nobody could do the work of God if he weren't from God. And he points out the fact, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so he is affirming that Jesus is from God. Now, he doesn't fully understand that Jesus is God, but he knows that he, the, that God is at work in his life because of what he has done. And so he's inching closer. At that point, the Pharisees banish him. They put him out. But Jesus comes and finds him in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out. And finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, And who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. The culminating point, Lord, I believe, and he makes Jesus Lord in his life. He worships him. Now, that's the, the, the significance of this story is moving us to that point where this man comes to acknowledge that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. I am convinced that John, this is the longest particular story like this in, 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 in the uh, Gospels. And I'm, I'm convinced that John did this to accomplish his purpose, which was to show that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah and to lead people to put their faith and trust in him. That's his purpose in writing the Gospel of John. I know that because he tells us that in John 20, in verse 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, here's where we are. I don't know where you are in your spiritual life. I don't know whether you can see or not. Now, you may have perfect physical vision, 2020, but I'm talking about spiritually. Are you spiritually able to see? If you are able to see that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, then I have to ask you, have you yielded your life to him? What a tragic thing, what a foolish thing to know who he is and not make him Lord in your life. Eternal life, salvation, forgiveness of sin, fullness of life is made or is received when you come to Jesus and do what this man did when he says, I believe, and he worshiped him. So that's the first point of significance. Now, as this man is moving forward in his faith, what is happening to the Pharisees? Well, I would like to start over there, but I'm going to start over here because he, he and they are at the same place. You know where they're going? They're going in the opposite direction going down. Because what we find is where this man was moving forward, they're going backwards. The physical blindness is more than, is not the worst thing. There's also spiritual blindness. And these religious leaders are spiritually blind. In verse 16, it says that they, uh, uh, they said Jesus cannot be from God because he heals on the Sabbath. And so they reject him. Why? Because they're committed to their rules and not to the truth. And Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, as he tells us in another location. And so the reality is that they, 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 they're denying him because of that. Not only that, they call the parents in. And, and they're, they're trying every way they can to undermine this man's witness because they're not, they're not willing to accept the fact this man actually has had something like this happen to him. And it's so obvious. And then they also declare, when, when the man comes back, that Jesus is a sinner. In verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. 
give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And then they say, we don't know where he's from. Well, they knew where he's from, from Nazareth. But that's not the issue. We don't know if he's really from God or not, and we're not willing to accept that. And so as a consequence, they are closing their eyes to the, to the obvious truth that has been demonstrated. Here's a man born blind that can now see. How do you explain that? In the same way, I talk sometimes to intellectual people who have a hard time accepting the Bible, and I point out to them, look at the people whose lives have been changed. You may not understand or accept some of the Scriptures. You may be able to find things that you can't explain or nobody else can explain, but I'm telling you, you cannot explain the change, the transformation in a human life when Jesus comes into that life. And that is reality just as much as anything else and more. And so the whole point I'm making here is these guys are going backwards in their faith. And in fact, in verse 41, in verse 40, they say, are we still, there's some of the Pharisees are there, and they say, are we still blind? And look at what Jesus says in 41. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. In other words, you are, your guilt remains because you think you can see. And they could see physically. They could function intellectually. They, they were looking at all kinds of, of, of documentation in their theology, but they're witnessing God doing a work in their midst, and they're unwilling. Through these years, I've had a number of conversations with people in various, at various levels who want, they're seeking human answers to spiritual and supernatural reality. And you cannot, you can't explain God. If you could, he wouldn't be God. He is God, and he has chosen to reveal himself to you and to me. And so what we do is we function with the revelation that we have, and when we see the demonstration of God's power, we need to acknowledge that as well. I cannot explain. I tell you, I don't know how a brown cow can eat green grass and give white milk that makes yellow butter. But I, I want to tell you, I enjoy milk and I enjoy butter. My whole point is, there are a lot of things you can't explain, but that doesn't change reality. And that's what we have right here. Well, what can we learn from this story? There are two or three things I think that are important to, for us to learn very quickly. Number one, and that's this. God, Jesus, cares for everybody. Not anybody is beyond his purview. He loves every The people that are marginalized in that day, Jesus received. I mean, look at the people that flocked around him. The sinners, the publicans, prostitutes. I mean, they were all... Jesus helps people where they are. He receives them just like he did in this uh, situation right here. And, and, you know, sometimes when we look at folks, it, it'll kind of make you roll your eyes if you're not careful. I am not an advocate for tattoos and piercing. But I want to tell you, I, the Lord has shown me he can do a work in the lives of some folks that have accepted that. I was this past week sitting with a guy who is one of the most dynamic and, and, and enthusiastic followers of Christ I've been around in a while. I want to tell you, this guy knows the Lord. He is five years in one prison, a year and a half in another prison first, and then, then five years. God changed his life, and now I'm talking to him about coming to work with us in our more ministry. And he's, it's, it's cold, so he's got three shirts on, and, and it goes all the way up to his neck. We're sitting there talking, and he says to me, he says, you may not, re you don't realize it, but said, if I took these shirts off, I've, from right here down, I got tattoos all the way to the waist. He's covered up with tattoos. Now, I want to tell you, some folks look at a tattoo, and they say, that guy, hey, hey, no way, he, 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 he's too far gone. This guy, I'm sitting there talking to him. He loves Jesus more than me and you and a bunch of other people. Jesus did a work in his life. Don't, don't, mar don't write people off. Don't reject people simply because they don't look like you. They may not look like you racially. They may not look like you economically. They, there's a whole lot of differences, but Jesus loves everybody. And consequently, our mandate is to love everybody and to reach out to every one of these folks because when Jesus died on that cross, his blood flowed down that cross, and that blood doesn't know the difference in anybody. It's for all. 
and he has died to save all. The second thing that I look at of the story, it's amazing how limiting our preconceptions are. You know, we have preconceived ideas about people. And, and as a result of that, we don't really see them. The disciples were, had preconceived ideas. This man's a sinner. Who, I mean, he's blind. He's got to be a sinner. And so they had preconceived ideas based on his blindness. These Pharisees, they've got preconceived ideas because Jesus violated their Sabbath rule. And, and it's amazing how our preconceptions sometimes hinder us from seeing people as they really are and what God can do in their life. And, and I think we need to, to overcome that. We need to realize when God gives us the mandate to share the gospel, he intends for us to share this gospel with everyone and we, we, and we can learn from everyone. I had a wonderful lesson on this. We, a number of years back... Uh, we had an intern come for a little while, and he was on the staff. Well, in the staff meeting, we had seven people on the staff besides me, and uh, we, were, we were talking about an issue that we were facing. And this young man was in there. And uh, so he's just listening. Well, after a little bit, he says, can I say something? And I said, sure. And I want to tell you, folks, in about five sentences, he set us on the right path. He said, well, you, you think about this and think about this, and if you do this, then I think you'll find the answer. And he was right on target. And you know how I went out of that meeting? Not just with the answer. I went out of that meeting thinking to myself, you know what? I can learn from anybody. This kid didn't have a degree. He didn't have any experience. He didn't have a lot of things. But he had Jesus, and he had a good mind, and he was able to point out to me and to the staff something that we were overlooking because we were trying to make a situation complex when it really was very simple. My whole point is sometimes we have preconceived ideas and that keeps us from benefiting from other people. Not only that, but notice also that in this story it becomes very clear that salvation, that is spiritual healing, is more important than physical healing. Did the man want to be well? Yes. Did he need to be well? Yes. Did Jesus heal him? Yes. But Jesus did something far more, and he may not even have realized his spiritual need, but Jesus did, and he helped him. And what I'm trying to tell you is, Jesus didn't heal every sick person when he came to the earth. That was not his purpose. But he did do this. He died so that everyone could have an opportunity to have their sins forgiven, that they could become the child of God by putting their faith and trust in Jesus, and that's the more important thing. And that's why it's so important for us to share this message with everyone so that they too can come to know Christ as Lord and Savior in their life. That's the most important thing. And finally, I want you to see that there's spiritual development here. This man, it didn't happen just immediately. There's a, there's a beginning point, and then it moves forward. As this, young man, uh, as this man gained insight or understanding about who Jesus was, and then he began to take these steps forward in faith and obedience, the end result was that he came to put his faith in Christ. Now, here's what I, I know. The more we learn, the more we are obligated to trust and obey. I know a whole lot more now than I did when I started out. I told you that six months later I was a pastor. I didn't tell you that after I surrendered to preach and uh, that within about, I guess, probably four weeks, I, 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 well, that night, I surrendered on Sunday. Wednesday night I preached my first sermon. And about, uh, I don't know, three or four weeks later, I went to Oakhurst Church in Clarksdale to share at a men's meeting. And... Uh, the, I, I got up, I didn't know anything. I mean, I had no theology. All I knew was Jesus had saved me. And so for about 25, 30 minutes, I got up and bragged on Jesus. And so at the end of the thing, when men are coming by, the pastor comes by, F.K. Horton, deep, 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 way down to here. He said, young man, don't lose that enthusiasm. I had no idea what he's talking about. Until about 20 years later, when the enthusiasm was waning, and I realized, you know, that's the important thing. Be passionate about what Jesus has done in your life and never lose that. Grow. It's a process of growing. 
And as we grow, God is able to lead us forward, getting closer and closer to Jesus. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. We'll sing that in a minute. But before we do, just bow with me. Let me ask you a couple of three or four questions to kind of put it in perspective for us. First of all, what about your sight? I'm not talking about your physical 2020 sight or, or with glasses or whatever. I'm talking about your spiritual sight. Do you have some blind spots that need to be addressed? Where do you need to grow in your spiritual walk? Are you willing to do whatever Jesus says, like this man who had the spittle put on his eyes and he went and washed? Are you willing to do whatever it is that God's calling you to do? Maybe another question is, who is it around you that you need to move toward, reach out to, begin to share, and to love a little bit in the Lord? I don't know, but during this time of response, think about those questions and let God give you the answer and then do what he says. And if you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, we invite you and encourage you to come this morning and let us help you to do exactly that. Father God, thank you for being with us. I pray now that you will, by your spirit, speak to the hearts of each one of us and help us to do what it is that you want us to do. In your name we pray. Amen.